what was our plan? What's changed? Where are we now? Where are we going? You can't just set a three year or five year plan and then put it on autopilot. You're never done. It's always evolving and changing. And so you have to be able to tell that story behind the numbers. Welcome to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast. I'm Sean McLean, partner at Hydrogen Struggles and member of the Global Industrial and Financial Officers Practices. In today's podcast, I'm excited to be talking to Kelly Schmidt, CEO of Benevity, a Calgary-based leading provider of global corporate purpose software. It is one of Western Canada's most successful technology stories, having reached unicorn status in 2020. Notably, Benevity's clients have donated over $10 billion to more than 326,000 nonprofits. Benevity added over 100 clients in the last year alone. Prior to her role as CEO, Kelly was CFO at Benevity, and prior to that, CFO of Solium and Smart Technologies. Kelly, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sean. Excited to be here. Kelly, we've known each other for a long time, and you've always had huge capacity. But these last few years, you've started a young family, moved from one high-growth Calgary technology company to another, taken the CEO reins from a founder, orchestrated the deal that made Benevity a unicorn, navigated a pandemic. The list just goes on and on. So my first and most important question is, how you doing? Well, to add to that list, we also did a couple of acquisitions. We're expanding the company overseas, trying like many companies to navigate the impact of the economic climate on the business. I've been rebuilding the executive team. I hit super elite status with Air Canada this year, which tells you how much I've been on the road and the speaking circuit. And our four-year-old daughter threw up during the night last night, so I was cleaning up puke off the carpet this morning. So if I'm honest, I'm pretty tired. You know, the more serious answer is taking on the CEO role and trying to fill the shoes of a very visionary founder is not an easy task. And so it's true what they say, you know, that it's lonely at the top. The job can be very lonely. And and I feel such a deep level of responsibility to our team, our clients, our investors, all the causes and the vulnerable people who rely on Benevity for support. And so it's hard not to feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And Thankfully for me, our founder, Brian DeLottenville, is still involved in the business part-time, mostly as a sounding board for me, and, and that's made the job a little less lonely. But yeah, it's flat out. Kelly, you're amazing, and you still have your sense of humor. Seriously, though, given all the things that we've all gone through these last couple of years, my colleague, James Serrano, recently published an article discussing the prevalence of fatigue in the workplace. You and I have spoken at length about the importance of mental well-being, perhaps now more than ever. How do you maintain your own health and wellness? And how do you encourage your colleagues to take care of themselves? Yeah, it's tough to do, but, you know, very critical for me to continue operating at this level with the schedule I have. So I actually have a fairly rigorous routine that involves a workout first thing in the morning, six days a week, you know, an adrenal cocktail and a bunch of supplements I take to give me energy and boost my immune system. I have a mindfulness coach. I try to sleep at least seven hours a night most nights, and also take time both to take care of myself, like going for a massage, as well as to enjoy my kids. When I manage to do all of these things is definitely when I'm at my best. If I let any of it slip, you know, it can spiral downhill pretty quickly. So I actually let myself get a bit too run down this fall. And before I could rectify it, I picked up a pretty bad respiratory infection that took me two months to get rid of. And so it was a good reminder that, you know, you need to schedule in these regular breaks to rest and recharge regardless of how many things are happening in the business, because I'm no good to anyone, you know, my family or benevity if I'm sick or burned out. In terms of encouraging colleagues to take care of themselves too, you know, something we do at benevity, particularly when we're in a time of rapid change, which there's been a lot of these past two years, is we remind our leaders about taking care of themselves and how to manage their energy and understanding what lifts them up so they can be very intentional about working through challenging times. When we look at the company-wide perspective, for the last two years, we've done something called Me For We Week, where the whole company is off work at the same time for the same week. We, of course, have our traditional vacation program, but one of the best ways to disengage is when you know no one is counting on you and your email's not blowing up because your colleagues are off too. And we found that people come back really refreshed and energized, even though it's a pretty short time. It's sort of the quality of the break versus the quantity. But I think whatever you do, it's important for the CEO and the exec team to role model it so that people truly feel like they can take time for themselves. And so one thing that I personally role model is I go offline when I'm on vacation. So when I take two weeks off in the summer, I'm off Slack, I'm off email the whole two weeks. The only way anyone can reach me is to call me, which, of course, they don't. 
so refreshing to hear a CEO admitting that they're human. And the missing piece often is that role modeling piece, Kelly, as you know. Really great to hear how you approach that. Kelly, you're a three-time CFO before accepting the CEO mantle at Benevity. What's that transition been like? Any advice for finance leaders who aspire for the top job? <laughs> Am I allowed to say don't do it? <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't wish this job uh, on anyone. You know, I think that for finance leaders, I'll maybe start with the second question first. For finance leaders, if you decide to take on the CEO role, the most important thing is you hire an amazing team, including an incredible CFO to replace yourself if that's the role you're moving from. Because you need to be confident in the skills that you bring to the CEO role, but hire people who are the very best at what they do, in, in particular in areas where you're weaker. So for me, that's product and engineering. And one of my first hires as a CEO was an amazing chief product officer who's made a big difference in our business. But I've also added a new chief people officer, a CTO, and, and very recently a new CFO as well. And, you know, to have a well-functioning company, you need a well-functioning exec team. And so if you want to have that, you need a very high level of trust. So, you know, hiring people that you trust to do the job is pretty key. You know, I found when I was a CFO, I really knew enough that I could complete any finance-related task myself if I needed to. As CEO, it's just not the case. Like You have to work through others because you're not the expert anymore. I think the other piece of advice is just put your ego aside and be willing to ask for help. Like There's no way you will have had all the experiences you need to be a great CEO. So I take all the help and advice that I can get. Now, back to the topic of how the transition to CEO has gone for me. You know, the biggest part of that transition was shifting from being mostly internal facing to being external facing. And I didn't necessarily envision myself as the person on stage speaking at conferences or being the company's top salesperson. So all of that was new to me. You know, given that I was dreading having to do those things, to be honest, the, probably the biggest surprise to me once I got into the role was how quickly I was able to adjust and how much now I actually enjoy it. I think what it comes down to is I love Benevity and I believe in our mission. And now I get to spend a lot more time talking about Benevity. So what's not to like? That's awesome perspective, Kelly. It's surprising how often we see former functional leaders continue to try to be the smartest person in the room and it just doesn't work as CEO. No. What would you say are the leadership skills and experiences you have found to be essential as CEO at a PE-backed company in particular? Anything unique when working with the financial sponsors? You know, this is actually an area, Sean, where having a CFO background is really helpful because the PE sponsors are very finance oriented. I think one of the skills that's helped me is the ability to take the complex and make it simple for people to understand. So, you know, a lot of people internally at Benevity don't understand how the private equity world works, as you'd expect. And so I find it's important to educate them on what our investors are looking for, the metrics they care about. So that we're really working together as a team to deliver both on the business results and the social mission. And it's not a mystery why our investors are happy or unhappy. I think flipping it to the investor side of the equation, it's very important to be able to tell the story of what's happening in the business to the investors and to the board. What was our plan? What's changed? Where are we now? Where are we going? You can't just set a three-year or five-year plan and then put it on autopilot, you're never done. It's always evolving and changing. And so you have to be able to tell that story behind the numbers. Kelly, you know that I'm passionate about helping Canadian companies succeed on the global stage. Any lessons you've learned that you can share that might help other Canadian organizations succeed internationally? You've been part of several that have achieved this. Yeah, this is a good question. I, if you're planning to expand internationally, you know, whether it's through acquisition or even organically by just setting up new locations, the number one success factor that I've seen is culture. It's also the number one factor when an acquisition isn't successful. So if you're buying a company, the cultural fit of their people with your team is the most important thing. And, and at Benevity, we've actually walked away from acquisitions that made sense on paper. They made sense for a product portfolio where the cultural fit did not exist. If you're expanding organically, it's kind of the same idea. I mean, sending leaders from Canada overseas to help establish those new operations and having people who can ensure that the cultural practices are consistent is really important. And I think probably the other thing that I've learned in, in my career is you cannot apply North American lens to everything. We tend to do that even though we know we, we shouldn't. And you have to be curious. You have to display humility and just really value the different mindsets of your international team. And 
create space for them to bring their knowledge of those markets to the table because they know things that you just don't know and can't know. Such a great point on culture in particular. And as we know, mission can be a real driver of culture. Yours is to act as a catalyst to infuse a culture of goodness into the world. What does that mean to you? And how do you instill this into the culture on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, when we think about our mission, the reason we use the word culture is because Every social issue that we're facing in the world today, whether, you know, climate change, food insecurity, racial inequity, whatever it is, it requires behavioral change at the individual level to solve. And so we are trying to enable that through companies and helping them to connect their people with a sense of purpose and to deliver social impact. But that's really what we're getting at when we talk about a culture of goodness. And so when it comes to instilling it into our own culture, We have a new, a week long experience for new employees, a week long onboarding process that, you know, I'm the first speaker on the first day of that for every new person who joins Benevity every few weeks. And we share our moonshot slide and we talk about the culture and what we're really trying to achieve. Once you're into the company, we talk about our why during every major period of change. We talk about it at celebrations. We talk about it in company presentations. We tell client stories and cause stories at weekly town halls. And and all of those things engage and energize our people and just remind them why we're here. We also walk the talk, though. So we ourselves, you know, regularly volunteer. Last week, our entire exec team served breakfast at the drop-in center here in Calgary. So it's important to actually live the mission as well. Given that, I'm excited to hear your take on the future of work, which is, of course, being hotly debated currently against the backdrop of a war for talent. What are your thoughts? How have you and your chief people officer worked together to navigate the changing expectations of employees over the past couple of years? Yeah, this one's been a bit of a roller coaster for for us, as I'm sure it has for many companies. I think the biggest thing we've done is we try to engage our people in the conversation and as much as possible use real data to make decisions versus being swayed by some of the loud voices or hearing what people want anecdotally. We recently made some decisions around our facilities footprint, which are kind of an example of this. So we we surveyed our team, which is about a thousand of us now, about how and why they use our offices or why they don't use them. And we also looked exactly at where all of our thousand people are living today, right down to the postal code. And we used all of that data to make decisions that involved closing our Toronto office, subleasing our Victoria office and shifting to a co-working space. And we're going to sublease a floor here in Calgary as well. And so for us, like we didn't go to the extreme of being fully remote, nor did we force people back because neither of those options really suit us. And so we're trying to find the right balance. I think the reality is that even though the market has slowed down a bit now, life has changed. Like the way we work has changed forever. And I personally am a big fan of that in-person interaction. And I myself come to the office most days. Having to be in physical offices five days a week, it primarily disadvantages women, particularly if they're the primary caregiver. And so as a company that is very serious about diversity, equity and inclusion, that's a really important factor for us. And so now when we come together physically, we do it with more intention and there's an actual purpose versus it being a mandate. And Jen, refreshing to hear that we see many organizations rushing back to a particular model without taking the time to really ask why or what. Do our employees want? What a great approach. Kelly, let's end on this critical topic. As CEO of a high growth organization, how does DEI factor into your strategy? Well, as a tech company that is 54% women, I think we are today, and, and an exec team that's over 50% women as well, it's, it's very central to the fabric of benevity. You know, it, it might be interesting to people that we've never had a targets around these metrics, but We just have have achieved them by trying to reinforce the behaviors that are really needed to make a change in this area. And, you know, one example of that is like we actually have almost as many men as women who take months of parental leave, not weeks, but months. And we have programs that support and encourage them to do that. And, And that's just a behavioral and a societal thing that we think every company should do. You know, as a female CEO myself, I also feel quite responsible to be vocal on this topic. You know, I think I was quoted recently in an article saying that's pathetic to the recent stats of women, number of women on boards and in exec roles here in Alberta. But day to day at Benevity, I consider the principles of DNI and how I build and lead my own team, how I set expectations for the rest of the company. And for us, many of the initiatives are grassroots, such as, you know, employee led resource or affinity groups. But 
we also put resourcing against company-wide efforts. And so you've got to be doing both to really make a difference in this area. Kelly, I've so enjoyed the conversation today. We started with the note that Benevity's clients have donated over $10 billion to more than 326,000 nonprofits, which is simply incredible. Hearing you speak today, it's also evident that you're having an amazing impact on your colleagues and providing a great example of how a Canadian company can succeed. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Sean.